You know, oftentimes we understand that it is grace that saves us, that we can't be good enough in and of ourselves in order to measure up to God's standard. It is what Jesus has done for us. But what so often happens is that even after a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ, we forget about grace. We need grace to live every single day. You know, what happens oftentimes uh, that I've seen in in many cases with uh, Christians, with believers, is that they come to faith in Christ and then, and they recognize that it's an absolutely free gift that they've been given. And then we enter into um, what is sometimes referred to as a debtor's ethic and that we feel like we have to pay God back and that now I have to measure up. It's almost like being given a, a house. You're, you're given a house by the generosity of someone who has far greater resources than you do And the first thing that we try to do after we've received this gift is we take out a mortgage to try to pay it back. Now, often what that would do is that diminishes the gift. It diminishes the generosity, the grace of the giver. You and I can't pay God back. There's nothing we can do to earn his favor. There's nothing that we have done that makes us love him less. There's nothing that we will do that will make him love us more. He loves us. And so we need to trust God's grace, not just for salvation, but for every single day. The way to have victory over areas that we struggle with in our life is not to work harder. It's not to try to do more. It is to believe that God really is changing us to look at what his word says and to take the promises of his word and seek to live as if they are true. I love how John Piper describes this because he uses the term future grace. It's an understanding that not only has God given us grace in the past, but he is a continual supply of grace that you and I need every single day. And the way that we are able to apply that to our life is found in Galatians 2.20. It's the picture. This is my, the theme verse of my life. And so on my last sermon, I thought it appropriate to at least share some thoughts on it. It says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, in this verse, there is a beautiful exchange. Jesus Christ took on my sin, your sin. He died the death that I deserved. He took on the penalty that I deserved. But in its place, he has given me his life. He's given you life. That's what we see in baptism. As we go down into the water, it's a picture of how Jesus has saved us and our sin, our failure, our insecurity, our anxieties, everything that falls short, everything that misses the mark, as Yano said, is covered over by the water, is covered over by his blood. But we rise up out of the water to walk in a new life, expectant, and reliant, dependent upon God's continuing future grace. So the first thing that I would would share with you is to trust God's grace. And one of the things that's significant, when you read through the scripture, you discover in each one of the Apostle Paul's letters, he begins with this phrase somewhere in the beginning of, of the letter. He says, grace be to you. It's a recognition that we need to receive grace. But he ends each letter with this phrase, grace be with you. It's a recognition that we also need to walk filled over and over again with the presence of the Holy Spirit by his grace so that we become who God intends for us to be. So that's the first one, trust in God's grace. The second thing follows on it, and it's this, live for God's glory. The best way that I know to put this is the way, the thing that should determine our life is simply this, 
Not I, but Jesus. Not me, not my will, but God's will. We are to live for his glory. To live to see his name be lifted up. To see his name be promoted. Jesus put it this way in Luke chapter 9. He said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So how do we do that? Well, let me, let me give you a simple suggestion because oftentimes where we get off track is in the conversations in our mind. Most of us, when we get up in the morning or when we're, we have some moments where our thoughts are just uh, able to kind of run free, the conversation in our head usually focuses around the word I. I want to do this. I need this. Um, I like this. I don't like this. Um, if they would just listen to me, they would be so much better off. Those kind of conversations happen in our heads. And it's all focused on us. But Jesus teaches us to live not I, not me, but him. He gave us this example about how we are to follow when he said, nevertheless, not my will to the Father, but yours be done. So one of the things that can help is to be intentional about changing the conversations that we have in our head to replace the I with we, recognizing that God is with us, the Holy Spirit is with us, or even better yet, with the name Jesus. Jesus, what do you want? What do you desire? How do you feel about this? What are your plans and your purposes for me this day? That's how we begin to live, not I, but Christ. It's so important, and I, I have to tell you, it is incredibly liberating when we learn to do it. And by the way, that is actually, I think, the best def definition of humility. Not I, but Christ. See, humility isn't thinking less of ourselves. It's thinking about ourselves less and focusing our heart and our mind on Jesus Christ and on the needs of others that he calls us to meet. And humility comes with an incredible blessing. Because you see, humility follows God like his shadow. Because a humble person will rest secure under God's wings as they live, not I, but Jesus. And so Jesus has called us to follow him, to follow his example, and to give him first place in our heart and in our life. Matthew chapter 26 is where we see this displayed it says this, then Jesus went with them, his disciples, to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father... If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus, in this moment, is facing the greatest trial, the greatest agony in human history. The physical, emotional, spiritual, and relational pain he was encountering at that very moment and what lied ahead is unimaginable. And yet the approach that he takes gives us an example. It shows us how to deal with our adversity and also how to live not I, but Jesus. Think about what Jesus did because these are the things that we are to do. In facing adversity, Jesus, first of all, he chose friends to be with him. We need each other. We need to be the church. The church needs you, and you need the church. Choose to make relationships here. Secondly, Jesus was authentic with his followers, with his disciples. He said, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. 
He didn't answer what we all answer when somebody says, how are you? I'm fine. You know, I'm doing good. Yeah, how about you? Jesus is authentic, and he said his soul was sorrowful to the point that it almost consumed him. Jesus shared his deepest heart with his friends. Also, Jesus invited them to pray with him. Now, we discover in the passage later on that Peter, James, and John, they were weak, they were tired, and they didn't do a very good job of standing alongside of Jesus. But his example is exactly what we need. We need to pray for one another, to be authentic with one another. And then we need to do exactly what Jesus did. He went to the Father in prayer and shared his heart. And he said, my Father, if it's possible, Let this cup pass from me, for the road ahead is difficult. And he shares exactly where he is with God the Father. Jesus is fully God, but he feels the full weight as being fully human as well of the dread of what was approaching him. But he says, not my will, but your will be done. He trusted God's plan and God's purpose. That's what we're to do. How did he do that? The writer of Hebrews gives us insight that says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. You see, you and I are not to live for right now. We are to live for the future glory and greatness that God will reveal. We are to live for the joy of being in his presence. We are to live for the joy of knowing other people come to faith in Jesus Christ as they watch our lives, as they see us faithfully respond to adversity, to trial, as they see our story portrayed, just as you heard in the stories of these three incredible young men. You see, each of us need to follow Jesus' example. That's how we learn to live, not I, but Christ, not I but Jesus. So we're to live for God's glory, and then finally, we are to rest in God's goodness. This is the secret that enables us to go through trials, enables us to go through difficulty, enables us to live for God's glory. It's in recognition that God does have a plan for each and every one of us. It's a famous verse, but it's so important to remember in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come to me and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Rest in God's goodness and the fact that his plan for you is different than your dream, but it is better. If we could see it, remember, I've told you this so many times. If you forget everything else I've ever told you over the years, please remember this. If we knew what God knows, we would always want what God wants and we would wait for his timing because his plan, his purpose for us is good. And the way that we're able to take that and really grab a hold of it and not just say it but believe it is to recognize that God takes pleasure in us as his children. You know, when he invites us into a relationship with him, he doesn't say, you are my slaves. He doesn't say, I'm going to make you do everything that you should do. He invites us to come in as his children. And not just children, but joint heirs, full heirs with Jesus Christ. That means you, men, are princes in the kingdom of God. And women, you are princesses. You have a royalty that God has given to you as his children because he takes pleasure in you and I. And so often we view God from the standpoint of of our own failures instead of the abundance of his grace and of his goodness. He tells us this in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, the Lord your God is in your midst. It means he's with you, a mighty one who will save. And here's what he says about you. 
He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Do you believe God sings about you? If not, I want you to make this challenge that you would take this verse for what it says and believe that God is that passionate about you and about me. You and I can bring him pleasure. He says in Isaiah 43, verse 4, he says, you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. So let me encourage you to hold on to these things. Trust in God's grace. Live for God's glory. Let his purpose become what directs and drives your life, and then rest in God's goodness because he is infinitely more good. I know that's not proper English, but he is infinitely better than you can imagine. You see, Jesus is the cornerstone of everything in our life. He is the one we can build all our hopes, all our dreams, everything we envision fully on him. To do that, though we need to trust in his grace live for his glory, rest in his goodness, and finally show forth his love. That's what he calls us to do. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the way you have spoken through the music, through the worship, or through the team, Lord, through these testimonies. Lord, now help us to respond. Help us learn and choose to say today, not I, but Jesus, to live for your glory, for your honor. And Lord, I pray that you would fill this church with your Holy Spirit. You would fill it with great joy. And Lord, that you would do abundant, marvelous things through your church that we call the International Church of Prague. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.